We're back for another exciting episode of The Spicy Life. I am your relationship expert and magnetic matchmaker, Spicy Mari. And today in the G-Spot, we have a phenomenal guest to talk about how important is sexual compatibility. All right, give a round of applause, go crazy for Dr. Shannon Chavez. Woo! She is a nationally recognized expert, therapist, and educator specializing in all things sexuality, including help for men, women, LGBTQIA and couples, the treatment of sexual disorders, sex education for conservative, religious, and cultural groups, sexual trauma and abuse, and compulsive behavior surrounding love, romance, and sex. She's a licensed clinical psychologist in California and Arizona with a private practice in Beverly Hills, California, Shape Center, where she works with individuals and couples of all genders and orientations to address sexual concerns and build sexual awareness through therapy, coaching, and education. Give Give a round of applause. Big up, big up, big up. Everybody's going crazy for Dr. Shannon Chavez. <laughs> you guys might recognize her. I have brought her on this show before. She is a phenomenal guest and had to bring her back for how important is sexual compatibility. So, so happy to have you on the show. Um, I'm excited to dive into this topic. It's something that my clients always come to me with. I'm sure you, I mean, this is your full-time um, studies and practice. And so I really can't, you know, wait to address some of these things, but we got to warm you up first. Um, so last time I believe I was, you were on the show, I asked you, um, one of my spicy breakers, um, and my spice breaker was usually how do you fall in love with yourself? So, um, when do you remember the moment when you fell in love with yourself? And if you already answered that, I'm going to give you a different one. Did you answer that for me last time? I did answer that one last time. Okay. So I'm going to give you this time. When did you discover your life's passion? So P for passion and spicy. Um, when did you discover your life's passion? Oh, that's a really good question. I want to say it was probably uh, in college when I was working for a sex therapist. And so I found this passion for all things sexuality when I was working with her because she was on the radio, someone that I had kind of looked up to. And I, she was a mentor to me and she kind of took me down the path and said, you should really do this. So she was very encouraging and inspiring. And I said, all right, this is it. This is the passion. This is but the key. I'm, I'm heading for it. Not even that many people would be, you know, reaching out to, to work for someone like that. What drove you to say like, hmm, I'm open to this opportunity. What made you want to even be open to that? You know, she was looking for an assistant at the time. She was writing a book. And so oh. I called her up and I said, whatever I can do to work with you, I'm willing to do it. And then from there, it ended up into a full position and I helped her with editing and writing and all sorts of things. So it was, it was a great opportunity. I still kind of remind myself that that's where I started and I would love to connect with her again. It's been years and years. <laughs> She, she put you on the right path. I love that. And I love that you were just like open and you put yourself out there. You know, sometimes we have this fear of rejection and we're like, oh, but they're going to say no, but look at how it worked out for you. And now you do this full time and have your own practice. So that's exactly. beautiful. That's a message. Don't give up on your dreams. You guys try ask anyway. <laughs> Ask anyway. That's what yes. I say. Don't hesitate. You never know what's going to happen. The worst thing they could say is no. I mean, if that's the worst thing, go for it. <laughs> I love it. So we're going to dive in today's topic. It's super juicy, um, you know, tantalizing. I want everybody um, who's listening to be comfortable with this. Um, and, you know, I, I talk about sex all the time on this show, but when we talk about intimacy, right, people think that like there's, that intimacy is sex and it's not always, um, there's several levels of intimacy and physical intimacy is just one of them. So I want to start off with talking about how important that is in a relationship. On a scale of one to 10, and we're just going to be very specific about sexual compatibility. On a scale of one to 10, how important is sexual compatibility in a relationship? I would say it's up there probably a nine or a 10, but we should probably define what it is. Because Let's most people it. think sexual sexual compatibility is liking the same things or having the same desires as a partner. And I think compatibility is more of your, your willingness and your ability to communicate with your partner in a respectful, open-minded way about their desires, fantasies, and sexual interests. So in my definition, they don't have to be the same, but the compatibility is your willingness to do that without judging, shaming, reacting, minimizing the importance that your partner has and your openness to create what I call healthy restorative experiences, which may be maybe acting on some of that or willingness to participate in your partner's pleasure. 
that's what compatibility is really about. When I see two people butting heads and just saying, no, I'm not willing to even entertain that idea or I'm not into that without even trying to understand it from your partner's perspective, that, that's sort of a lower compatibility. More compatibility is that openness and willingness to, to have sexual empathy, to say, I get that because that's what you like. That makes sense. I don't have to love it, but you like it. And that right. makes me you know, will understand you more. So that's really important in a relationship. Yeah, that's so why I'm it's more the openness. It's less the like, we have mind blowing sex. It's more all these other factors that go into it. So you guys hear that? I need you guys to be open, open to your partner. And I love the empathy word, right? Emp yes. Empathetic to their needs and them in reciprocating that. So can you talk a little bit about your practice a little bit? What are there like the top five reasons that you see couples struggling um, when it comes to physical intimacy? Well, actually the sexual compatibility piece. Most people come in and say, we're at a crossroads. We don't know if we, you know, we can't seem to agree on what the other is interested in. We don't know how to navigate differences within our sex life. Hmm. So that's a big one. And that kind of plays into the second concern, which is uneven desire. So when people have you know, different levels of desire and they don't know how to navigate that. Yeah. He or she wants it all the time, I don't want it. Or when I want it, they don't want it. What do we do? How do we navigate those flows? So they really need a moderator, someone to come in and help say, what, what's, what is going on? How does that happen? Who initiates? What's, uh, what are the ways in which you try to engage one another? So a lot of it kind of feels like sexual referee or coaching where we're really getting <laughs> through of how people do what they do sexually. Uh, another big concern is maybe medical or physical issues going on for males that can be erectile functioning issues, problems with ejaculation for females, orgasm problems, yeah. a lot of pelvic pain. So many females I know are having painful sex. So please come to sex therapy or see a GYN if you're having those issues. There's a lot of things we can do with that. Another one is sexual boredom. People are bored in the bedroom. They are doing the same old thing. They yeah. feel stuck. They don't know how to spice things up. They feel uh, just bored. Yes, yeah. they need some spice in their life. <laughs> so they come in. They come in for you know some coaching. What should we do? How do we kind of get our fire, stoke that fire, so we can have a more pleasurable sexual life together? And then I would say the final one, I'm glad you mentioned intimacy mm -hmm. because there are many couples that come in and say, intimacy is great, sexual intimacy is not, or sex is great, communication is not. How can we integrate what we're doing in one area of intimacy into the other so that all areas are strong? And that's a lot of couples I see that they say, everything's great, but this. So we're right. kind of fine tuning and figuring out how to help them in that area. At least they're coming to get the help, right? So my question would be, if you learn early on, right? Say that it's not just married couples coming, but um, you're in this, even like the dating phase. So no commitment on paper yet, <laughs> but you're in the dating phase and you learn early on that you are struggling, um, you know, with one of those five things, right? You guys have now been physically intimate and one of those five things come up in the relationship, but you're already emotionally attached. You're already invested. You've spent so much time with them. And then this sexual incompatibility starts to creep in. Do you break up? Is the relationship over? And you're like, nope, that's a deal breaker for me. Or while you're in the dating phase, deep dive in and start working on it. I'm going to say deep dive in. It can teach you a lot about your connection with that partner. It builds trust, it builds security, and things are going to happen regardless, whether they're happening now or they're happening years from now. I think it builds a good foundation to address it rather than run from it. Mm -hmm. If we avoid it or run from it, then we're probably perpetuating patterns that we've already had in our relationships. And why not address it together? Partners need support around these things. And if your partner is willing to talk about it and say, hey, I've got this issue yeah. or I deal with this concern then be open-minded, ask questions and find out a way to support that person. Unless there's, I would say the only maybe red flag or deal breaker would be if a partner's not willing to do anything about it, but says, hey, I have this issue and I don't wanna get help or I'm avoiding dealing with it. And then you're left stuck 
with no way to support that partner. But I would say most people are willing to work on these things together. And that's where I see a lot of people come in to sex therapy. I've actually worked with a couple that's been dating for two weeks, which I thought was amazing. They, wow. for weeks and they said, we have to address this because we want to have an incredible sex life. And we already, you know, are on this kind of shaky ground of not knowing how to deal with this alone. So can you help? And I love that. Wow. Even early on. So usually after two weeks, someone, and what I've seen is people usually would like tap out and say, no, they're not for me, you know, for it to be that young and fresh of a relationship. But what's interesting is two weeks in and they are already like, no, let's work on this. Let's improve that. I love that. Um, can you speak a little bit? And you mentioned um, uh, erectile dysfunction earlier. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about, because you know, this is an education show about what exactly that is and what those symptoms look like just for anyone who may be struggling with that and not knowing that that's what's going on. Yes. So erectile dysfunction is a male's inability to maintain an erection, get an erection, or they are able to get erect, but not fully erect. And there's many, many reasons why that is. There's a large percentage of those individuals that are dealing with physical barriers, and that can be blood flow issues to the genitals, a lot of medication interferes with ejaculatory mm -hmm. function and uh, erectile functioning. So things like antidepressants, it can be other medication taken for heart issues. And so that's really important too, is if you notice side effects from your medication, to talk to your doctor about that, because it could be too high of a dose or something is interacting with your body's ability, your sexual functioning. Yeah. Uh, erectile functioning can also have a psychological uh, set of causes for a lot of males. It can be sometimes fear of pregnancy, believe it or not. So what's happening is their, their mm -hmm. anxiety that builds up before sex is creating a block or barrier from their ability to get that full erection. So the psychology, the mind and body is what I do a lot of my work on. I want people to realize that the mind has a very strong, powerful role in how our body functions. So if there's anxiety or stress or anticipating uh, a bad experience happening sexually, your body's not going to work. Another thing I've seen with ED that so we call ED, erectile dysfunction for short, is when you've fallen out of love with your partner and there's mm. a lot of Sometimes I'll see males say, I'm just not able to get erect. Well, there's also there, that's a big sign of emotional intimacy yeah. issues. Maybe you're resentful towards your partner. Maybe there's a lot of unprocessed material in your relationship that's leading to your body communicating that in a sexual space. Mm -hmm. So usually I'll say, what is your penis trying to communicate when it's not getting <laughs> Saying that you're not saying to your partner. So we, you know, kind of assess it in that way, but there are, you know, it can be both factors and it's very common. It's not something that only occurs in later life for men. I've seen men in their early twenties have erectile dysfunction. So it's important to assess it at any age and it's not uncommon. So there's a lot of shame around it, but it can happen at any time for males. And there's a lot of solution and treatment options. I love that. And because you're, the, it's, you know, this openness, willingness to, you know, talk about it, to get help. Um, you know, you keep mentioning like communication when your partner is open, um, like let's take advantage of that. Um, what about when it's not necessarily medical, right? So um, certain relationships can have a partner in there who's asexual. And um, it's when they don't experience like sexual attraction to others um, of any gender. Um, can you explain a little bit about what asexual is and how that can, you know, sometimes be challenging in a romantic relationship where the desire isn't there? Yes. You know, asexuality is a sexual orientation and it's, it's more new than other orientations. I think it's always been around, but we've only started the dialogue around what this is and recognizing it as an orientation recently, I would say in the past 20 years. Mm. And it can be on a spectrum, which means some asexual individuals lack sexual and romantic attraction towards partners. Some identify as having romantic attraction and intimacy desires and needs, but no desire for any sexual interaction or intimacy with a partner. And then there are types of asexuals that may enjoy sensual touch, mm. uh, 
cuddling, kissing, they what we may consider erotic behavior, but they have no desire for any genital stimulation. So they may say, I love snuggling and kissing, but I don't want any sort of sexual genital based contact or stimulation from a partner. So you can see it kind of varies. And I, it's important if people are asexual that they're able to identify where on that spectrum they lie and that normalizes their behavior. It's not uncommon. I think people tend to feel um, that they're abnormal because yeah. they're asexual. But I think understanding it more, there's still a lot that people can engage in when they're in asexual relate. Well, they're in a relationship with an asexual partner. It's, it talks, you know, it tends to be about being creative and figuring out what works between the two of you. And it's not always a deal breaker, but it can be for partners if yeah. sexual intimacy is really, really important. So it's, uh, you know, very, very important to if you are a partner of someone that's asexual to do some research and understand what that means before maybe judging what the partner is orienting towards, which can create a lot of conflict. Well, a part of um, desire in a relationship or a part of even like, um, you know, the the necessary lust that sometimes, you know, required for you to want to, you know, take their clothes off or take them down um, is, you know, this romantic attraction. And if it's not there, or if the um, sexual desire isn't there, sometimes that can affect your self-esteem if you know that your partner doesn't desire sex with you. For the people who are experiencing that in a relationship, how do they get over that hump to know that you want to have sex with someone who doesn't desire sex? How do they then make themselves feel whole or loved or, you know, worshipped and, you know, when their partner doesn't desire them like that? I would find out how your partner does desire you. What What is the connection or glue that keeps you together? I think the problem with that type of thinking is what we call sexual scripts. They are these narratives that we tell ourselves around how people should have sex. Mm. And the reality is there are many ways to connect on a physical level that may not necessarily need to be sexual. That can be pleasing for both partners. Because what you're describing is a script, right? I want to be romanticized. I want you to be desired. I want you to want me. And that's what we see constantly. Film, TV. Yeah. I mean, that's what the They want the romance is. novel. Yeah. <laughs> my feet and tear my clothes off up you know all that sort of intensity and romance and passion is programmed into how we think about sex and for asexual people it's not necessarily that there's been any trauma or any background it's just sort of a part of them that isn't there it's kind of like I think of it like the food we eat someone having a preference for one type of food versus another it doesn't necessarily mean anything pathological so that's why it's important to be creative and say well what are other ways we can engage because yeah. there may be a, a, another way to get that feeling of desirability without it looking like the script that everyone's used to. And then how do you, how would you describe those two partners showing um, empathy for one another, right? Even if it's not an asexual relationship um, or one that doesn't identify as that, it's just two people who no longer are like maybe even craving one another because of time of, you know, all the multiple things that can be like distractions um, when it comes to creating arousal. How do you show empathy towards the partner who's not interested in sex with you or, and to the partner who wants it? <laughs> right. Be curious about it. Ask questions. Sometimes we just make assumptions, right? You're this, or you're going through that, or you don't want this, but sometimes there's an underlying issue. Maybe it's mental health. Maybe they're not feeling great in their body. Maybe they are dealing with depression or some other issue that's coming up. Maybe they're also lost their libido and they don't know where to start. That's where I find a lot of people in my practice. I just don't know what I like. I don't really know what turns me on. And I always think that's the best place to start because you can only go up from there. All right, let's figure out what that is. Because ev everyone has turn-ons. You know, even if it's the slightest thing, even if you're asexual, there's still things that light you up and make you feel good. So we want to explore that. And the empathy piece comes by asking those questions, you know, being open to that. If your partner says, I don't know, not to get frustrated or annoyed or take that personally, but support them in finding out how to get to that place of knowing and maybe exploring together can be a good way to do that. Fun. So it sounds like we're going to be playing games 
um, in addition to going to you for help when struggling with that area. <laughs> and are there are different exercises um, and games that you recommend. I'm a huge advocate of games for my clients when it comes to building all kinds of different forms of intimacy, not just sexual. Um, can you give like a spicy tip or a game that you recommend when couples are starting off to explore this journey together for the first time? Yes, I love, love games. I'm glad to hear you say that because games get people, you know, feeling excited, anticipating, and it's also what our libido is all about, playful energy. So games can be things like uh, doing some sexual interest inventories. It can be, uh, you know, exploring different types of sexual behavior. So you can take a list and say, let's try some of these. I have this nice tool called an extra genital matrix. It sounds Ooh. more complicated than it is. <laughs> and you kind of go through and check where from body parts and ways I like to be touched you can kind of check off and evaluate different types of touch you want to receive in different areas so games are mainly awareness and education kind of building an awareness of what you like but they're also interactive you're doing it together with a partner so uh, that's something I like to do and then there's another game that I love an erotic treasure hunt where I have clients go around their house and find things that they can that. Be their pleasure partner or to be pleasured. It can be simple things, you know, a belt, a tie, a, a feather, you know, a certain, you know, piece of material. And, and it helps people get very creative because there's no right or wrong. It's basically, you know, what you find is what you find and it gets people, you know, kind of in a silly energy and having fun and outside of the box of how they think of sex. So that's why I love games, because it pushes people's limits to open up in ways that they might not, unless they're prompted to do something like a game. Right. <laughs> I'm on with the spicy life with my consulting firm and with this podcast, my entire mission is like to restore the family unit, make love cool again, um, commitment, um, transparency, like really making sure that people appreciate and value relationships again, right? Because we're living in a time where, you know, the marriage rate is slower for uh, different age groups. And then, you know, the divorce rate is extremely high. So when it comes to um, one challenge that comes up, especially with a lack of, you know, sexual compatibility, um, the whole notion that if my partner doesn't serve me or we're not sexually compatible, I can now have an excuse to step out and cheat. Right. Do you deal with that in your practice where couples are coming to you? Someone was, um, you know, unfaithful and now they want to restore the relationship or get back to a place where they both desire each other. Do you feel like the lack of sexual compatibility is an excuse? Like that's so that you have permission to cheat if you're not getting your needs met and if so, or if not, so I want you to answer that one first. And then the second one is like, how do you address that hurt that came with the cheating? It's definitely a slow process. So yes, people come in. This is a big issue and concern. Uh, we first start with just the foundation around rebuilding trust. So there has to be a full disclosure. That's something that I require for infidelity. And that includes talking about the behavior, talking about you know, their own understanding of why this behavior happened and basically a timeline of what's gone on from the point in which this decision was made to the point where either there was a discovery by a partner or a disclosure around this infidelity. So what we do is I always try to look at it as, you know, not necessarily a crisis that a couple is in, but an opportunity for growth, because I find that you know, affairs and infidelity can give us a lot of information as to places that you need to heal in your relationship. Mm. Maybe they were negligent around or avoidant. And so I, I find that there's always a lot that couples can do to rebuild if they're willing to do that. But I haven't found too many couples that are not willing to work on their marriage or committed relationship after an affair. Does it always work? No, but there is a willingness to at least look at both sides of things, be accountable, take responsibility, and rebuild, whether they're rebuilding to co-parents or separating. And we do all sorts of different arrangements for couples as they try to work through this. And it's a slow process. I want to mention that too, because the partner that yeah. has been unfaithful is usually like, all right, how can we sweep it under the rug and get back to normal? And 
it's a slow process. You know, there's a lot of tears, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, a lot of rebuilding. So uh, I do mention that because it does take time. And usually I'll have a structure required for couples, individual therapy for both and couples work simultaneously so that each partner is supported in their own space while we work on the tough rebuilding of the yeah. relationship. Yeah, that's and it's it is uh, is something that's challenging to come back from. But like you said, it is possible, right? Because there's a lot of people who are like on the fence. They don't know if they should just tap out, call it quits, or you know, separate or divorce from the relationship, or if they should actually go through you know the necessary requirements for trying to heal, forgive, and rebuild. So a lot of people are at a crossroads when it comes to um, infidelity, where they're like. I'm taking a huge risk if I accept this person back into my bed. And sometimes there's a time when they aren't desiring the person sexually because they're operating out of fear, fear that this person is going to betray them again, fear that they're going to make a fool of themselves again, fear, you know, that this person isn't still being, you know, honest with them. How does, how does the person on the receiving end of like trust having been broken, what did they do in their personal journey to allow themselves to start to accept their partner back, knowing that that's what they want, but not knowing how, what would be like the first step in being the person who the, the crime was committed against? Yes. I think first it's normalizing those feelings because I think a lot of the time what I've seen with that partner is that it's been all about the cheating partner and not a lot of validation towards what their experience has been. And there's a lot of, um, it's kind of like the process of grief. There's a lot of disbelief. There's a lot of self blame. So validating all of those feelings is important. That way there's not this you know, guilt or shame around you know, I should have known, or why did this happen to me? You know, validating all of those feelings are important. That way they have their own space to feel what they feel without their partner around. I think that's important too, because when it's about the couple, it's about the dynamic. Yeah. And sometimes it's important to get that space individually to validate the feelings of what they've gone through. And then the second thing is trust doesn't get rebuilt in a day. And that's yeah. also a struggle is, what if I feel like this for a year? I've had people say that. What if I never get over this? And so what we do is never guarantee that there's a magic number of when, you know, how many months or how long yeah. it's going to take until you feel better. But what I often try to create as a foundation for this couple is let's focus on the behavior. Let's look at what can change versus what's not going to change. You know, what can change is that commitment and um, consistency towards changing behavior, whether it's communication, that's a big area that yep. we focus on first. And if that, if the partner that has been unfaithful is willing to do the work, that's a huge um, gesture of trust and rebuilding and commitment to the relationship that I think is just a, it's the bottom line behavior that needs to be there before moving forward. Um, and you don't see that with every couple. Some parts say, you know, I'm not willing to go to therapy. So if these are the types of things that you're dealing with, those are probably deal breakers because mm -hmm. you're not going to change someone's resistance. Right. If a partner is willing to do that. Great. You know, it's, it's about creating that space for that communication to happen appropriately and safely. That's also important during this process. I can see the challenge being too one of the partners or maybe both are dissatisfied, right? And they're starting to think about other people. They're starting to maybe emotions are coming up or feelings are coming up or even just like lust is coming up for um, whatever temptations come their way. The challenge though, with like acknowledging this and then going getting help before they cheat or before there's any indiscretions is that now they have to admit to their partner that they kind of want other people and then being punished by their partner for this desire. But what would you say about that? Would you still recommend like, nope, come in anyways prior to the cheating because the ramifications of cheating are usually harder to come back from than the ramifications of being open and honest? Absolutely, absolutely. Because that, you know we act on these impulses, but don't necessarily think about the consequences. Yeah. So if you come beforehand and say, look, I hear I'm at this 
point where I'm feeling I want to go this way or that way, or what should I do? And sometimes validating their feelings is helpful too. And just the validation of, you know, makes sense you would feel that way or whatever may be coming up might be helpful because they're not being validated at home. Maybe they're being ignored at home. Maybe there's not time being spent together. So we are able to identify some of the issues or elements that are leading to this desire or intention around straying outside of the marriage. So I think it's important to come in and get support. And then, so this is like, <laughs> this is one that comes up often um, and it's pretty, it's getting even more popular. We see it mentioned in pop culture. Um, I think there was even something in the tabloids about, um, which Kylie Jenner said is not true, but her now having or being open to an open relationship. Um, Let's talk a little bit about open relationships. So like, is this a good go-to when you're not satisfied or maybe like your partner has cheated and you are like, well, you got it in, so I want to get it in or let's just make this relationship open. Is that a good solution to a lack of compatibility ever? I wouldn't say it's the entire solution. It's a possibility and solution, but I would say I would never recommend that unless there's a solid foundation within that relationship. So I never see it as a quick fix to a problem that we're just kind of brushing under the rug, but it is something that I've seen work really, really well for a lot of couples. It's not only about sex. Sometimes opening up in a consensual way is about meeting other intimacy needs. And I think in my own view of what's wrong with modern relationships is that there seems to be too much dependency mm -hmm. on intimacy within the relationship. So people feel suffocated, overwhelmed, or uh, you know, we're asking to meet all of these needs within one person. You yeah. Know? my best friend, my support system, my lover. And so opening up can sometimes balance out those intimacy needs within a relationship, but only if that primary relationship is solid and strong, because that's, it's not just a, you know, I want to have sex with other people. So we're opening up so I can have a free for all. Everything is communicated. There are contracts that are written up. Oh, wow. Everything is negotiated. Everything is talked about. I, you know, if someone were to say, hey, I'm, I'm going on a date this, this week and um, this is where I'm going and this is what time I'll be gone and I'm planning on being out for this long. Everything is openly communicated. So I think there's a lot of misconception that it's open relationship and I'm just, you know, on vacation with my <laughs> lover for the weekend and then I just come back to my spouse. It's not like that at all. It's very, very open. You know, there's a lot of intimacy involved in order to get to that place of agreement around what you're both okay with as you open up. Um, sorry if you hear the banging. Our house is under construction still. <laughs> I'm like, I can hear it. I don't know if you can, um, but it's pretty loud. I'm like, I have a feeling um, my husband's going to get yelled at after this. Um, <laughs> um, but when you, we're speaking about intimacy, right? There's several levels of intimacy. You just said that maybe not every form of intimacy is being met within your partner. Um, and if we break down intimacy, it's emotional intimacy physical intimacy, um, there's spiritual intimacy, uh, financial intimacy, and recreational intimacy. And um, when we speak to these forms of intimacy, and intellectual intimacy, let me not forget that one, that one's huge. When we speak to these, and say your partner isn't satisfying those, I love that you are suggesting, because this is something that I completely agree with, is having different relationships um, that satisfy some of those intimacy needs, because your partner cannot be responsible for 100% of your intimacy happiness. Um, you are responsible for that as well. And so if you want to introduce to your partner um, that, hey, I know we've been trying to meet these other needs with family and friends and outside people, but I now want to meet it with uh, intimate relationships, right? Physical intimate relationships or romantic relationships with other people. How do you even bring that up without your partner feeling inadequate? You know what I'm saying? Like, because that comes up often is like, well, I can never suggest this thing because if I do, I run the risk of my partner leaving me or not feeling like I want them because they can't meet my needs. Right. You know, it's all about the approach because if a partner feels inadequate, it's important to say, you know, this isn't really about you. It's about what's going on with me. And I'm sharing this with you, but I think right away, we're, we're so reactive when we hear things, right? Anytime there's intimate sharing, it's about what did I do? I'm not enough. 
And so it's important to, to make it the approach about how you're feeling, what you're going through. Because if you're describing it in a way where a partner does feel inadequate, then there's obviously a communication problem. Hmm. I think also we want to normalize that. We're going to feel possessiveness, jealousness. We're going to feel all of these emotions. We're human beings. We yeah. can't avoid them. But that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't approach these topics because of that. We don't want to avoid things because of our emotions. Emotions help us grow. It helps us get to our values around what we really want in relationships. So I am never fearful of jealousy or possessiveness coming up. If anything, you know, we all feel it. Even animals feel it. I have my dog right here in my lap and she's, she gets jealous all the time. You know, it's <laughs> that we deal with and we can't, you know, be avoidant of that, but we can look at how to, how to support our partners in their jealousy, how to uh, create a sense of adequacy so our partner doesn't feel responsible for the changes we're going through as we present this material to them. So I think it's just always about that gentle approach. And then do you find that having an open relationship or presenting swinging even to the relationship is a better approach than just flat out cheating? Yes, absolutely. Because it's consensual. Cheating is never okay. It's, it's non-consensual. It breaks that bond and trust. And for many people, it's unrepairable, where if you're opening up and creating an arrangement or agreement that you both are okay with, there's a lot more possibilities. Maybe yeah. even you can explore together. There's you know kinks you could get into. There's different types of community. You mentioned swinging. There's uh, you know, open relationship groups. There are places people can go. You can even go to a resort where you can uh, be open to, you know, enjoying as a voyeur or exhibitionist and enjoy <laughs> sexuality. So there's a lot of options. So that's why I think people, when people are like, this is the only way you need to come talk to someone and figure out what all of those options are. And I love that you brought up open relationships. It was the biggest trend in my practice in the last five years. Oh, wow. Why do you think that is? I think it's more socially acceptable. I think people mm. have a lot more designation within open relationship. You know, it's not just uh, having multiple partners. There's things like monogamish or people that are, you know, opening up um, occasionally and not always. So there's just a whole array of different ways that couples are designing their relationships to work for them. And I think people are realizing that these old traditional views around relationship work for many, but not for all. And so designing it in a way that works for you and learning more about it. I think that's where I've met a lot of couples. We're yeah. curious, but we know we have our own judgment. How do we, but we want to know, is this right for us? And I love that, that openness to learning about it. There's a lot of great material out there. There's podcasts, there's books, there's teachers that are experts in this area that can support, you know, any views or myths or disbeliefs you may have about what opening up means for your relationship. What would you say the success rate though of those relationships are that open themselves up to letting or allowing other partners in or even relationships that have experienced cheating? Um, what's the like recovery or success rate of those relationships versus the ones that are like, nope, we're by the book, 100% faith or nothing. Um, which ones do you think last longer? in your opinion, or what you've seen? That's a great question. I would definitely say there's more strength in the relationships that have opened up in more of an ethical open way. So they've had the communication, there's been no infidelity, there's no mistrust. The ones that have been more problematic is where there's been problems or secrecy before, mm -hmm. and then this come up as an option or solution to that, but there's still a lot of wounding around that original betrayal. So that can be a little bit more of a problem as you're moving forward. But those that kind of present it together and say, hey, this is something I'm, I'm interested in or I want us to explore this together, I think their success rate is, is much, much higher. And I've seen some really great things come out of that. And the primary bond and the primary relationship becomes stronger as a result of that. And I've seen even that primary couple end up saying, our sex life has improved even though my partner is exploring other relationships because they're bringing back confidence and erotic energy into that primary relationship. How does this affect the children, right? So like your children see this dynamic happening or unfolding with their parents. What's what's usually their receptor or their perception of what's going on when you start to see mommy or daddy going on dates with other people or, you know, um <laughs> you know, they've opened themselves up to other relationships. How do the children how are the children usually affected by that? That's a good question because people are either 
open with their children and, and openly communicate what's going on, or they hide it from their children as a result of, you know, maybe their own maybe shame that they haven't processed yet around how they feel about this. I think children are really, they're really um, open and susceptible. I think children, we, we tend to be very protective of children. Yeah. Children are, you know, what they see you feeling good about it, confident about it, and guiding and modeling that in an appropriate way, children are okay. But if you're hiding in secrecy mm. and sad and, uh, you know, uh, dealing with all your emotions around it, that's going to affect your children a lot more than just being open and honest about what you're doing. And I think children are exposed to so many different orientations and family life and relationships that, again, they're very susceptible and open. Uh, but I think individuals and parents need to be more uh, reminded of that openness of children because they're not as sensitive as we think they are. And those might be your own feelings projecting onto the kids. That part. Um, can you just speak a little bit to the finally dynamic? If you are in a relationship with someone um, that it, this, these indiscretions have happened, right? Um, cheating has taken place. And your children have witnessed it, or maybe they see parents being unfaithful to one another. How likely is it that they end up being unfaithful to their partners? It's a possibility, obviously, because there are you know very important stages in psychological development where we develop our sense of identity. And if you're observing that in your environment, whether it's conflict, parents in conflict, fighting, abuse, uh, anything like that, we can develop a working model of what we believe love looks like. Hmm. Our attachment styles develop so early in life. So I do believe that does have an impact, but we can heal and move past that, especially if we have a good family system where we're talking about it. You know, so many times I meet adults in therapy that will say, my parents got divorced, they never talked about it, or there was cheating or abuse in the family, no one ever talked about it. So I internalized all of this negativity or yeah. false beliefs about how men treated women or how women were to men. And I developed these distorted views on relationship. But I think the solution is talking about it. You know, if you're getting a divorce, talk to your kids about it. Let yeah. them know you don't have to be so protective that we end up creating more internal damage to their belief system than we can by just normalizing it and showing them that it's okay. There are different ways that people love and connect. And we just make that a normal part of conversation with kids. That sounds amazing. The unfortunate part is that a lot of parents don't, you know, they're not open and honest with their children, but we'll often see this narrative on TV shows, or um, even you'll hear about with like, uh, friends or even, you know, sometimes my clients where they will put on um, or put it on the notion that Papa was a rolling stone or, you know, daddy was emotionally unavailable or he wasn't there. Therefore, now this is why my man is this way or he'll even embrace that narrative of, well, you know, I always saw my dad cheating, you know, he was a player. So that's why I'm a player. Like how much of that is true and how much of that is just a story that you're telling yourself as an excuse? Big time story you're telling yourself as an excuse. You know, what we tell ourselves becomes our reality. Mm -hmm. That's why it's important to look at your belief system and your values. Because a lot of the times that's just old programming, things you've carried with you throughout your life. And maybe you're reinforcing those beliefs through relationships and behavior. But you never stop to say, is that really working for me? Is that what I want to be as far as my own model or view on life and relationships? Probably not. So mm -hmm. uh, that those narratives are extremely powerful. I see that a lot with sex too, you know, men yeah. want, and want sex more than women. Women never initiate, women want romance, you know, these things that we tell ourselves and they become our reality. And that's a lot of the work I do in my practice is challenging that. Do you really believe that? Is that true? What other way can we look at these things? Right. People have a, you know, way to exercise their own beliefs so that they work for them in their life. And sometimes it is these like voids that they're trying to fill or voids that they believe that they have, that they have to search outside of the relationship in order to fill when they could fill them within, but they haven't practiced or tried or attempted every, you know, possible possibility in order to get that need met. So sometimes it's like this belief, like my partner can't do this when you haven't even talked about your, it with your partner, or you haven't, you know, even presented this as an option, you're making this, you know, false assumption and then acting on it because of whatever, you know, emotions or beliefs you have that are going on. And now afterwards, you're trying to play cleanup when you could have, you know, prevented that all along. But this is probably why your, you know, business is booming um, for, for these faults. <laughs> 
<laughs> what did you notice happening during quarantine? Did you get a lot of couples coming to you? Like, oh my God, I'm trapped with this person for a year. <laughs> How has business been since quarantine? You know, I think that couples either blossomed during quarantine by having this time where they're relaxed and at home together, where they could work on their relationship, where they can, you know, really focus and prioritize uh, intimacy because none of those distractions were available. And even yeah. simple things like commuting to the office, being home for dinner, being able to be there to take a walk in the middle of the day. Yeah. All changes made a big impact. I would say the couples that struggled were the ones that were at home, working together at home, and also, you know, taking care of the kids at home. I think mm. I've seen my parents struggle probably the most during quarantine because there wasn't a lot of time for self. There were more responsibilities. And so there was a lot of burnout, stress, overwhelm, and um, enmeshment where they didn't have a lot of space and time to be who they are and do the things that actually self-regulate and help yeah. them with stress. So those couples really struggled. And, and I think it, you know, a lot of the work that I was doing with couples was creating a map of how to take care of self and relationship and balancing that out within this time while we were stuck at home and be creative about that. Even if, if it's, you know, going into your room with the door closed, so you yep. have time to yourself and setting boundaries around personal space within the home that made a big difference because I think what I see a lot of couples do is they just uh, assume that if we're in the same space, we have one another's attention and we can mm -hmm. ask for what we want, have a conversation, but setting those boundaries really helped during the time in quarantine. And then they can carry those on even after returning to the office or getting back to their normal day-to-day -day life. And being in the same space also too, I think we have this misconception that, that that equates to quality time just because the person's in your presence. Um, and not so, not so much like, right? You have to check with your partner. How do you define quality time versus how I define quality time? And it may not look the same. Um, I get this question, you know, asked oftentimes on interviews as well. Um, and, you know, the media is like, what have we seen about relationships, you know, after, you know, COVID ends, are people going to start cheating now that the world opens back up? And I'm explaining the same thing. I'm like, no, they should have been building their connections and forming, you know, strong bonds during this time when they both had each other at home. Um, one thing that I'm not going to lie, I, I'm more concerned about, and this is a personal question that I want you to answer for me, is um, I could care less if the world is opening back up. I'm about to have a baby, right? So how is that going to affect or change my sex life when this new person is introduced into what has always been him and I? Um, now there's a third party that has, you know, a little opinion of their own or a little life that, you know, we're responsible for. Dr. Shannon, what advice would you have for me as a new parent coming in, making sure that, you know, love doesn't, you know, fall off of my to-do list with my partner? Give me some like spicy tips on what I can continue doing. I should, I should know these things, but I'm not going to lie. I am nervous. I know what I tell people, but then I'm like, okay, I need to hear, you know, I need to hear somebody else giving me this, you know, information and this advice. Give it to me, serve it to me. <laughs> Don't put too much pressure on yourself to bounce back to this amazing sex life. I mean, if anything, this time that you're going to have after you have your baby is, is this precious time. I mean, nothing, even biologically, your libido is suppressed for so long after child or birth for a reason, because you are bonding and attaching to your child. So that can be a really precious moment for you and your husband. I mean, it can be a whole family bonding, but I wouldn't put too much pressure. Or we've got to get back to what sex was like before, because in reality, sex is never going to be like it was before. We don't want it to be like it was before. We're always kind of stepping into new sexual territory. So I think post uh, baby, it's going to be about figuring out what that is. Your body's going to change. You may have different arousal points. You may have different levels of desire. And I think for a partner who is supporting their partner through this, it's being open to those changes and not putting that pressure on, setting more realistic expectations. I imagine both of you are going to be tired. I mean, my favorite title for what I was calling during pandemic was lazy sex. You know, it's okay. <laughs> Have lazy sex. It doesn't always have to be swinging from the chandelier sex. It can right. Be like, we're physically just kind of having a lazy time pleasuring each other. So those types of things I think help with setting the right expectation. Um, but I wouldn't put too much pressure and, and just be open to what it is day by day. 
and instead of worrying about it, that worrying about sex, it creates more distress than mm -hmm. being able to kind of ride that wave through that change and transition in your life because it's it's a once in a lifetime kind of thing unless yeah. you're having a lot more children, so you want to enjoy it and not feel oh great, I gotta you know please my husband and balance perform. <laughs> <laughs> I love that we're normalizing lazy sex, though. <laughs> it doesn't always have to be this spectacular show. Um, uh, but like, that is something that I feel like, you know, we even what I suggest for my clients is like, you know, put it on your to do list, like throw it in the calendar so that it's something that if it is important to you, you, you know, can make time for it. Um, you know, studies show that if you put sex on your to do list, you have more sex than couples who are trying to do it spontaneously. Um, you know, so I just, you know, as my body goes through these changes and the baby comes, I'm just like, okay, you're right. I am putting some of that stress on myself. Like I got to get my bounce back. I got to get my snap back. I got to make sure I'm the bomb mom. I got to make sure that I still stay the spicy wife, you know, and there is this like personal pressure that you put on yourself. And a, a lot of women probably do on like what to expect. Cause sometimes there are this fear of the unknown and, you know, you, you're trying to anticipate for it and you want to have this sense of control, but some of these things are just out of our control. <laughs> you can do the best you can, <laughs> but this is why you, your profession exists. Because when we do struggle with things like this, we, we, you know, we have, you know, a sex therapist that we can go to. Right. And I think after this time too, it's better to redefine how you look at sex. You know, sex isn't always about, uh, you know, intercourse or, you know, having an orgasm, you know, sometimes it might be kissing and touching and caressing and your body's going to be sensitive after childbirth. So you may, you know, your nipples are going to be sensitive. Everything's going to be healing. So it, you may have a completely different idea of what sex looks like, but that's where you can be really creative and say, you know, and find out what works for your partner too. And also for, for male partners to expand their definition of not the whole penis focused sex that they're all <laughs> Think about other ways they can experience pleasure in their bodies. I, I think that's also an opportunity to grow sexually. So it's not just here's what I need in order to get off, but there's different ways that you can experience connection because partnered sex is connection. If it yeah. wasn't you just go masturbate and meet your own needs, but it's about connecting with your partner. And if you're both tired or you're both feeling pressure to have a certain kind of sex, come up with a different option. That's the best solution that's going to work for both of you. And sometimes affection is enough in those moments when you're like, okay, you tired? I'm tired. Okay, let's just hold each other. <laughs> let's just lay here naked. <laughs> there is other forms of intimacy that you can have that doesn't always require penetration. And I think that we have this conception that like, if we're not performing, that like the relationship is doomed. And, you know, that's a lot of pressure to put on yourself and, you know, for your sex life. But do you ever, do you notice that partners can be just as satisfied without that element, that typical type of sex with these other elements of affection, especially for those couples who are struggling, you know, with a partner who doesn't have a high libido or doesn't sexually desire them because maybe they're asexual. Um, are they, can they be satisfied in that relationship without always having, you know, that, that penetration? Yes, absolutely. But they've got to work on their mindset because if their mindset says that's the only way I feel good mm. or uh, that's sex and all this other stuff isn't sex. That's the biggest struggle, that psychological barrier of the way we perceive what is erotic, what is yeah. sex. So that's a big issue. I mean, uh, to me, it's it's like eating the same meal every day. You know, we want to have variety. We need variety with sex. That's the biggest cause of low libido is lack of novelty and variety with sex. So yeah. Where, you know, if we, if we can't get past that, sometimes that's more about a power struggle where I want what I want. I'm not willing to negotiate. You owe me this. You know, there's a, a lot of other underlying issues happening within that dynamic that aren't really about sex. Sex just unfortunately mm. becomes the casualty of that fight. And it becomes about, you know, who, who gets what they want and how can we exhaust our partner into agreeing to this without... <laughs> open to negotiating. I think that's the biggest solution to uh, undesire, uh, uneven desire and desire issues is just be willing to compromise, find ways that be, meet both of your needs. It's really that simple. Ding. She said a key word, negotiating. Um, I need you guys to <laughs> take that advice um, because that is also a part of like within, you know, my spicy method of relationship coaching even is learning to say yes to your partner. 
And what yes is, is not just, you know, bending over and, you know, saying yes to anything. It's about compromise in the art of negotiation. What am I willing to sacrifice and put on the table in order to get this need met and serve my partner's need here, right? How do we come to like a fairness of exchange versus like the be all say all, you know, I will only say yes if it's this, like negotiate the terms just like you would any deal. What do those terms look like? So I love that you um, ended on a positive spicy note right there. You're going to um, give us the last question that I have for you, which is the naked truth, um, where you're going to answer a personal question that the audience gets to get familiar with you. Okay. So my naked truth question for you is, um, if you could swap bodies with anyone for the day, who would you swap bodies with? Who would you be for just one day you would live their life? swap bodies well it's going to be a male body because I think that would be way too much fun to see what all of that fun <laughs> is and if it's going to be a male body it'd have to be a pretty good male body so I'm going to go with Dwayne Johnson because I oh my god Zeke I think he's got such a beautiful body I jump in that body every day and once for once and try that body out <laughs> oh my god I think I might agree with you <laughs> The Rock, he, he, that might be the one for, yes, I think that's like a great, a great like pedestal right there because he is phenomenal. So I'm going to take that too. I think I, I think I agree with you 100%. Usually I say JLo, um, but you, but you're right. Dwayne would be a nice body to hop into. I would probably like be rubbing on myself all day though. Um, <laughs> oh, lifting heavy things, tossing things across the room. I mean, <laughs> endless <laughs> testing your strength out <laughs> just lifting the couch just because <laughs> I love that okay Dr. Shannon you have to let everybody know um where they can find you um Dr. Shannon Chavez has her own practice you guys so if you need help please reach out to her um where can they find you how can they discover you how can they learn more about your practice and your services so I'm on social media, all social media platforms at Dr. Shannon Chavez, drshannonchavez.com. And I also offer a 15 minute complimentary phone consult. So if people are kind of on the fence about therapy and they have questions and they want to see if this is the right fit, please call me. I'm happy to speak with you. And I have three other therapists in my practice that are amazing to work with. So they can find me on my website and sign up there for a consultation. Beautiful. Okay, you guys, please reach out to her. She is incredible. Um, and you guys, you guys can always play with my Twitter or stroke my Instagram at Spicy Mati. Go to thespicylive.com, click and subscribe to the Spicy Live podcast um, and our YouTube channel. Share this episode with a friend. And there you guys have it. You have just been spiced. The Spicy Life.